Tell you what, let me go ahead and open in prayer, and then we'll invite uh, Alan up to give us our presentation. Uh, welcome, Alan Alethra. Alan, I, my memory is, again, not going to be very good here. I know Alan is pursuing a degree in philosophy at the moment. He is active uh, in his El Camino, El Camino Baptist, Baptist Church, Church uh, active in the adult ministry there, uh, teaches an apologetics group. So he sounds like he is, and I'm sure, well equipped to lead our discussion tonight. So we'll have a <coughs> question uh, and answer period afterwards. So uh, if you do have questions, we'd ask that you just kind of jot them down if you can. And, um, uh, and we'll do those afterwards. Okay, is that it? Are you ready, Alan? Ready to go? Okay, here's, uh, here's Alan. All right, well, uh, I want to thank everybody for uh, joining me tonight. Uh, before I get into this, now, Fred, you got to tell me, do I got to push? Second button. Second button? Right. Yeah. Yep. Aww. All right, that's my beautiful daughter, the oldest of my daughters, the middle child of five. I have five children. Um, and if that doesn't scare you, it should, because they scare me. <laughs> wow. Uh, no, I love my kids. They're amazing. Um, well, I, I appreciate y'all joining me tonight. Uh, I really do. I think this is an important topic, and I think it's something that touches all of our lives. Uh, so as I get my gadgets here uh, set up, let me just tell you a little bit about uh, my background just briefly before I get into this and, and why this is this kind of thing or this, this uh, 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 enterprise, so to speak, at large is, is important to me. Um, I was born and raised as one of Jehovah's Witnesses uh, and spent 21 years of my life uh, as one of Jehovah's Witnesses. When I was 21, uh, I left and came to Christ. Um, and I developed a deep desire to, from that point forward, always know what I believed and why I believed it. It became very important to me. So. Uh, through a series of research opportunities, uh, just personal research online, I stumbled across some websites uh, that were putting forward what they called apologetics. And at the time, I had no idea what that was. It sounded to me like it sounds to most people who've never heard of it, like you're saying you're sorry for something. Uh, and that, of course, if you've had any exposure to this group at all, or any, any of the work of reasons to believe, you, you kind of have an idea of what it is. It's not that at all. Apologetics uh, has, uh, as at its core, uh, a defending the faith. It actually comes from the Greek word apologia, uh, typically referenced at 1 Peter 3.15, where it says, uh, always uh, be ready to give an answer or make a defense for the hope that is in you with gentleness and reverence or respect. So it has to do with defending uh, the Christian faith. Now, apologists of, of many stripes in many areas, but as far as Christian apologetics go, that became a passion of mine. Uh, and so uh, that's why I'm interested in this kind of thing, and that's why I'm, I'm here presenting this tonight and a part of this group because of that. Now, uh, we have talked about in this group previously that there are two kinds of apologetics, two kinds of defending the faith. There's positive apologetics and negative apologetics. Uh, positive apologetics have to do with giving reasons, uh, evidence for the Christian worldview to support it, making it uh, reasonable, uh, and giving people uh, uh, tools to help them come to, to knowledge and, and, and ultimately belief uh, by means of God's call and Holy Spirit. So it has to do with making a case for Christianity. Negative apologetics, on the other hand, isn't something bad. It just has to do with kind of the opposite. It has to do with giving answers to those who would criticize Christianity, those who would uh, offer challenges to Christianity and the Christian worldview, and it makes responses to those, to those things. And tonight we're going to be dealing with one of those challenges. It's actually a primary challenge, and that is the, the idea of the problem of evil. Specifically, we're going to be talking about natural evil tonight. We'll get to what all that means. Um, but briefly, I want to say that uh, this is not a new challenge. The problem of evil is nothing really new. It's, it's very old, in, in fact. Um, and though it's likely been pondered for much of humanity's existence, it's really the first articulation of it is accredited to the third century uh, Greek philosopher Epicurus. And Epicurus said, if I can get this going, there we go. He said, is God willing to prevent evil, evil but not able? Then he is not omnipotent. Is he able but not willing? then he is malevolent. Is he both able and willing? Then whence cometh evil? Is he neither able nor willing? Then why call him God? Uh, this is a very old question and has been pondered for <coughs> millennia uh, now. 
in a nutshell, this argument or this claim, this problem, claims that there is a problem with these three statements. There's, there's something wrong here when these three are together. The idea that God is all powerful, the idea that God is all good, and the idea that evil exists. And that the, the claim is that somehow these don't really work together. There's some kind of a, uh, a disconnect there. Um, now, as with any critical analysis, I think that it is important to clarify terms. Um, so to that end, uh, what do we mean when we say evil? I mean, that might sound like a silly question. Most, most of us have a pretty good uh, intuition about what evil is. But just to be clear, just to make sure there's no mistakes, we're going to offer this definition from uh, Christian uh, philosopher and apologist Paul Copan. He says that evil is departure from the way things ought to be. Now, we could get much more technical with it, but I think that's a pretty straightforward uh, definition. Departure from the way things uh, ought to be. Alternatively, we could say something like bad things happen. Right? I mean, that's pretty simplistic. And we all know more or less what this looks like. Um, if somebody steals your car, we recognize that's not the way things ought to be. Right? Something's wrong there. We hear reports of, of people who have left their infants in dumpsters. Uh, terrible things like this. We recognize something's wrong here. It's not the way it's supposed to be. Somebody opens fire on a crowd of innocent people. Something's wrong there. And oftentimes we revert back to calling these kinds of things evil, uh, which has some kind of meaning to us. Now, look, I won't kid you guys, uh, this challenge really is the primary challenge uh, of, of critics and skeptics of Christianity. It's their ace in the hole. You even heard from this little clip uh, by Hugh Ross. Immediately in this debate, you know, this, this uh, 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 you know, front lines atheist philosopher goes for the problem of evil. It's their go-to thing. Okay, so critics and skeptics love this. And it's because it's so uh, difficult to, to muster through and has been uh, typically... Uh, something hard to weed through, but we're going to hopefully provide some clarity uh, to this tonight. Now, um, this isn't just an attack on Christianity, this problem of evil. It actually is, is more broadly an attack on the Western uh, Judeo-Christian Islamic model of God, right? So this monotheistic one God, as opposed to some of the other Eastern religions where there's you know, a bunch of deities or whatever, this, this idea of the one all-good, all-powerful God, this, is, this directly attacks that kind of a model. Um, and because this is such a deep topic, there really has been a great deal written about this. Uh, enough to fill volumes, quite frankly. Uh, so we could spend several sessions discussing this, this and really just scratch the surface. Um, but I hope that we could, we, I can give you some valuable resources in the time that we have tonight. Um, in order to do that, though, I think that it's important to break down this topic because it is so broad. We're going to get specific tonight and talk about some, some very specific things. Um, so the first distinction that I want to make, and I'm going to refer you now to your handout, because this flow chart's going to help us navigate through where it is we're trying to go. The first distinction I want to make under the problem of evil, uh, the, the larger umbrella of the problem of evil, is the distinction between the logical problem of evil and the evidential problem of evil. Now, the logical problem of evil maintains that God and evil are logically inconsistent. The existence of God and the existence of evil just don't work out. Okay, now what I mean by logically inconsistent, I've offered a couple of uh, a sample sentences here. If I said to you, I am a bachelor, okay, and then I said right after that, Erica is my wife. Incidentally, Erica is my wife. Uh, so that part is true. But if I said, I am a bachelor, and then said, Erica is my wife, immediately you're going to recognize there's a problem there, right? Those two sentences don't work out. Now, they're not explicitly contradictory. But they are implicitly contradictory. That is, I am a bachelor implies that I am not married. Erica is my wife implies that I am married. And of course, I am not married and I am married are contradictory. They are explicitly contradictory. Both of them cannot be true at the same time. So, <coughs> excuse me. Um, similarly, the claim with, with this logical problem of evil is that the existence of God and the existence of evil are logically contradictory, implicitly so. The claim is that an all-good God and an all-powerful God would eliminate evil, but since evil's here, God must not exist. And that's where the argument tends to go. Now, the traditional response to this uh, has to do with free will. I don't have a lot of time to get into the depth of this, uh, but let me just say... Um, that the idea here is that God cannot force us to freely choose to do good. All right? If we are really free, then we're free to do bad. Right? That, that's kind of that's the point. So long as we have freedom to choose how to act, we have freedom to do uh, evil things. 
And so long as the state of the world is dependent on our choices, then evil, specifically the kind that, that you and I do, this, this, what, what in the Christian realm we call sin, uh, is not inconsistent with an all-powerful and all-loving God. So we're free, therefore we freely choose to do wrong, and that's just the way it is. And in order to get rid of that, you're going to have to get rid of the freedom. All right? And of course, that, that's problematic in and of itself. Um, and because of this, uh, really most advanced uh, critics today, those who know their stuff, the people that are, on, like, like they talked about Michael Ruse, who are on the front line, they don't go for the logical problem of evil. It's pretty much been abandoned by anybody who knows anything. You might, you're going to still find it on the Internet Atheist because you find all kinds of stuff on the Internet Atheist, you know. Um, but you're really not going to find this from the people that know their things. Um, instead, what you're going to find is a, a slightly modified version of this, and that's what's called the evidential problem of evil. Okay, the evidential problem of evil is a weaker argument, um, but it is more resistant because it rests on probability and not certainty. All right? So the argument claims that evil is evidence against the existence of God. That is to say that this evidence makes the existence of God unlikely. Okay? So what it's saying is probably God doesn't exist because of all the evil that we see in the world. And you can see how this makes a difference than certainty. If I were to say, uh, you know, um, uh, certainly uh, there is an invisible man in this room. Well. I've got a lot of work to prove that, right? Or maybe let me give you a different example. Certainly you're not dreaming right now. Now, is it possible that you're dreaming right now? If it's possible, then my case is lost because my case rests on certainty. But if I say, probably you're not dreaming right now, then that makes my case a lot stronger, right? I've got less to prove because now I'm working on probabilities. And that's where the evidential problem really gains its power because though it's weaker in terms of what it's claiming, it's less, uh, less likely toppled because it's working off of probabilities. Now notice again that this is not saying uh, that um, it's not saying that God and evil certainly can't exist, it's just saying they probably cannot coexist. And since nobody really denies the existence of evil, what the, what the proponent of this is going to say is therefore God probably doesn't exist. <coughs> Excuse me. Now, we're going to come back a little bit later uh, to why this argument doesn't work out well what the problems are with it, what its weaknesses are, why it ultimately fails. Um, for now, let's have a closer look at the alleged evidence uh, for this evidence, evidential problem of evil, what, what it is that they think really leads to the uh, non-existence of God. Uh, and again, within this realm, there are two further branches. We've got to break it down even further, I'm sorry to say. <laughs> this is such a big problem. Within this realm, there are moral evil and natural evil. Okay, so now, moral evil, again, I'll just briefly touch on this. Um, this has to do with evil by means of agents, okay? Uh, now, the agents don't have to be human. From a Christian worldview, moral evil can be done by the demons. Uh, they are agents as well, all right? Persons, but that's what we're talking about. It's a personal agency. It's what people choose to do, whether human or not. For our part, we're going to limit it to, to humans anyway, uh, by and large, or at least the skeptic will. They're not going to be appealing to demons, otherwise they probably wouldn't be a skeptic in the first place. <laughs> so. uh, but at any rate, you get the point there. Um, like, the, like the logical problem of evil, the response to this is again going to hinge on free will. Okay? Again, like we said, as long as we're free, we're free to do wrong. So the only way to eliminate that is to get rid of the freedom. Uh, and, and again, a lot more could be said about this. We could go into depth on this and make an entire session about this, but this is outside the purview of our focus tonight. So I just wanted to hinge on it to show you that there's another arm here. Now, the type of evil we're really talking about tonight is natural evil. Unlike moral evil, natural evil does not depend on our actions. It doesn't depend on what we choose to do as free agents. It is indep independent of our moral choices and behavior. Natural evil also can be broken down <laughs> into a couple of categories, but we're going to explore these two categories tonight. Um, and there are at least two categories that I can think of anyway, and that's environmental and biological. Okay, so these are the kinds of natural evil we're going to be talking about. Now, um, environmental, natural evil... Uh, it can be a variety of things. It can be atmospheric, uh, it can be geological, it can even be chemical in nature, but it typically has the potential to do a great deal of destruction and even a great deal of death on a large scale. Uh, so this is the kind of thing we're talking about with environmental natural evil. It can include things like earthquakes, hurricanes, floods, fires, and so on. Now, before we get into uh, some, of the, uh, some of the specifics here of these, these kinds of natural evil, I think it's important um, to ask a, a relevant question of whether or not natural processes can themselves really be considered evil. Yeah. 
Um, so it's not altogether clear to me that they can. But let me give you a couple examples of how this works out, I think. Let's think about gravity. Gravity is pretty important, isn't it? Uh, from, what, from what we know about uh, you know, Einsteinian relativity and, and the warping of space-time due to mass that keeps us grounded and everything, it's, it's got benefits. I mean, obviously, I can stand here right now instead of flying off you know, in, into space because of gravity. Uh, our food, our snacks, stay you know, nicely placed on our plates until we put them in our mouths, you know, because of gravity. Uh, if you've ever thought about uh, you know, some of the major sports uh, arenas uh, or games that, that are played uh, uh, you know, in, in our society, how would these things work without gravity? How would you do football and basketball and baseball without gravity? Is it even possible? It would certainly change the dynamics of these games entirely, right? So gravity is pretty important. On the other hand, if I fall down, I could possibly injure myself. If it's high enough, the, 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 the fall, the, or far enough, I could even die from this. But does that mean that gravity is evil? I, I, I would tend to say no, I don't think so. But that's okay, let's look at another example. How about water? Now Jim gave us a, a pretty amazing presentation a couple of months ago about water and, and all its benefits. And my goodness, there are uh, a bunch of them. Uh, but just to kind of give a, you know, a, a recap of some things that are immediately um, uh, available to us or immediately impact us, our bodies are 60 to 70 percent uh, composed of water. Uh, our brain is somewhere around 75 percent composed of water. Our blood's over 80 percent composed of water. Three quarters of the surface of, the, of our planet, this place where we live, is covered in water, right? So uh, there's water all over the place. While we can survive for over a month without food, in about a week or so, we're going we're gonna to have troubles if we don't have water some kind of water source to drink. So it's pretty important. Um, and yet, if you choke on, on something, on some water while you're taking a drink, it's uncomfortable, right? We can even die from just a few inches of standing water. But does that mean that water is evil? Well, let's look at the flip side then. Let's say, what about the processes? What if we set them aside? What if we look at the pain and the discomfort that's caused from these things? Maybe that's the evil, okay? Maybe the pain or the death or whatever uh, that, that we experience, maybe those things are, are the bad part. Well, what would it be like if we didn't experience pain? If we didn't experience physical pain, that is, um, it's likely that we would have trouble surviving because we, we wouldn't be alerted by our bodies when they get harmed, right? There's actually a condition uh, like this that's called, uh, let me look at it here, congenital analgesia. Okay, this is a condition where people don't feel physical pain. And in these cases, uh, these people often have to be constantly monitored to ensure that they don't harm themselves in some way without even realizing it. So, pain serves the important purpose of telling us when our body has been damaged, right? When, when we're in need of some kind of medical treatment. It actually has a benefit. So it can hardly be called evil as well, right? It's got a pretty important purpose. In fact, these natural processes that are often uh, the target of the term natural evil uh, serve important functions in our world. So let's talk about some of these uh, bigger processes and, and see really what, they're, what they serve for us or you know, how they work in our world. Maybe they're not all the, the evil that they're made out to be. Let's talk about earthquakes. Now earthquakes first serve a, a, a very important part in what's called the carbonate silicate cycle. Um, now, let me just say, I'm not a scientist, <laughs> okay? There are several here who are, are resident scientists that know a lot more about this stuff than I do. So I'm just going to give you what I'm aware of here. When it comes down to the details, I don't know. And I, as I understand it, there's even some of this process that the best scientists don't totally understand. So maybe we're a good company with that. Um, but this carbonate silicate cycle helps compensate for the sun's increasing luminosity. Uh, by regulating the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, which, which in turn regulates the temperature of the planet. So it's important. Um, carbon dioxide in the atmosphere is dissolved in rainwater. That rainwater then falls to land in a form of mild acid. When it comes in contact with some silicate rocks on the ground, these rocks are dissolved. Some minerals are released, and those, of course, are released into nearby rivers and streams. Where do the rivers and streams go? They spill into the ocean. Once in the ocean, these elements then are absorbed by plankton into their shells. Then once the plankton die, they tend to drop to the bottom of the ocean. 
Uh, some of them are dissolved, some of the shells are dissolved and, and the, 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 the elements go back into the ocean. Some of them are buried in the sediment along the ocean floor. Because of tectonic activity, at the, at the basin of the ocean, you've got these plates rubbing against each other. And what happens is one of them subducts underneath the other one. When that happens, these elements that come from the plankton shells are they then come in contact with some other elements and release carbon dioxide gas, which vents up through volcanoes back into the atmosphere. So we've got this cycle here, an important part of which is tectonic activity from where we get earthquakes. Without that tectonic activity, this cycle wouldn't work. And then we'd have environmental uh, problems on our planet as well. <coughs> um, now notice this, off, this also, this, this cycle uh, offers uh, a good explanation for the benefit of volcanoes. So if, if one wondered how can volcanoes, you know, what, what's the problem with that, or one wanted to claim that volcanoes were evil, well again, they're an important part of this cycle in releasing that carbon dioxide back into the atmosphere as well. But there's another benefit. Um, a study out of Harvard uh, in 2007 indicated uh, that as the mass of a rocky planet, that is to say as opposed to a gaseous planet like Jupiter and Saturn and our outer planets, a, a rocky planet like our inner planets, ours included, um, as the mass of a rocky planet uh, increases, the thickness of its crustal plates decreases. And so does its resistance to tectonic motion. So that is, the greater the mass of the planet, uh, the more it's going to have tectonic activity, and this activity is going to be more aggressive. Okay? Now, interestingly, in order to sustain strong plate tectonics, the kind of which uh, can allow for advanced life to even exist, um, in order to sustain that on a dry, rocky planet, the mass of that planet would have to be over twice what Earth's mass is. However, uh, Earth has an abundance of liquid water. And because of this, that allows for a sort of a softening in the minerals of the crustal plates, uh, allowing them to slide a little better, allowing them some, some flex to move around. In fact, <clears throat> the Earth falls just inside the lower limit of the mass boundary of rocky planets with an abundance of water to sustain strong plate tectonics. I mean, it's right there, just at the lower limit. So if it were any bigger, then the, the uh, plate tectonic activity, earthquakes, would be far more abundant and more aggressive. On the other hand, if it were any smaller, then the, the tectonic activity would be ephemeral. It wouldn't be very valuable. It wouldn't support uh, uh, advanced life. Um, as the study uh, from Harvard points out, a planet's mass really has to be virtually identical to Earth's mass, and it must be wet, but no wetter than the Earth in order to have a chance at plate tectonics supporting advanced life. So once again, folks, it, it, it seems like we've got a just right planet, and earthquakes play a very important part in that uh, kind of planet. Now, other benefits of, of earthquakes include uh, the early endurance of land masses. When, when the Earth was young, there was a lot of volcanic activity going on. Water began collecting in, on the Earth, and it, and it was, you know, the, it was a, a watery planet for some time. Had it not been for earthquakes, there wouldn't be continents, right? The, 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 the land masses would have stayed submerged. But because of the tectonic activity, this allowed draining off, allowed continents to form, mountain ranges, and so on and so on. That's why we've got continents to live on today, which I'm pretty happy about. Because if you've ever seen Waterworld, that doesn't look like a very fun place to live in. So uh, I think uh, uh, continents and land masses are pretty important. It also provides for a stable water cycle, earthquakes do. And they allow for biodeposits. Pretty important in our society, right? That this earthquakes allowing for some of these uh, coal, oil, natural gas, the fossil fuels to, to come together and pool so that we can draw from them and have the kind of technology that we have today. Our, our uh, technology is, at, at present anyway, largely dependent on those. And again, another similarity from this is tsunamis. Tsunamis are really just the product of underwater earthquakes, right? So again, that kind of thing is a result of an important process that our, that our planet needs to support advanced life. Now let's talk about uh, hurricanes. <coughs> Pardon me just a minute. I'll let you look at that while I fix it. <coughs> hurricanes and other uh, tropical storms provide heat transfer, which is again an important part of regulating our planet and allowing for advanced life. Oceans uh, tend to trap heat from the sun, as well as leach carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. 
And without some way to distribute that carbon dioxide and heat to other parts of the planet, uh, what our planet would experience catastrophic environmental changes. Tropical regions would begin experiencing heat spikes. Aquatic life in those areas would be detrimentally affected because of the increase in temperature in, in the, uh, the oceans. Other areas would experience dramatic cooling due to lack of greenhouse gases and so on and so on. This would be problematic. Instead, hurricanes and tropical storms provide a redistribution process that allows for a more uh, homogeneous climate on our planet. Now, of course, there's still differences in the, in the climate of various areas of our planet, but it would be far worse without this redistribution process. So a benefit, an important benefit of hurricanes and other storm-like uh, activity. Uh, other things, sufficient rainfall to water the earth. Of course, we, you know, in California, we, we can definitely appreciate the value of that, right? We don't get enough rainfall here. We need more. Uh, and so storms provide this to other parts of the planet, even if we don't get it as much, that's okay. Um, it, it, it does provide that benefit of providing rainfall so that plant life can grow and so on and so on, right? So that's a valuable uh, element of, of storms, hurricanes of which are just the strongest. Plant fertilizer from lightning. We've got this nitrogen fixing, right, where, where uh, when, when lightning strikes it, it converts some of the nitrogen in the atmosphere to usable nutrients uh, for plant life uh, to, to help them grow and flourish and so on. That's a product of storms. A pruning of forests by strong winds. Uh, forests can get ov overgrown with, with, uh, with you know, the, the weeds and plants and so on and just get not really uh, sustainable because there's so much there. Hurricanes come along or strong, strong uh, storms and they uproot the, the weaker trees. They pull up some of that stuff and make way for other plants for the plant life to flourish, which is again an important part. And then finally, uh, drought breaking rainfall, which is similar to the, the second point there, but in some areas uh, there are monsoons, typhoons, cyclones that come along once a year or something for a period of time and provide the sustaining water for that entire year until the next year. Again, without that, the plant life, animal life, and so on couldn't flourish in those areas, all as a, as a, a, by means of these storms, uh, hurricanes uh, being one of those. Now, we can make these same kinds of observations uh, for a variety of other natural processes. We could talk about tornadoes uh, and how there's heat distribution there and, and you know, due, to the, uh, due to uneven heating, those things uh, come about. We could talk about landslides and how those things happen. We could talk about floods and how they redistribute minerals in various areas. We could talk about fire and again nitrogen and some various things, you know, getting rid of some overgrowth in, in, in areas. Uh, all of these processes have some kind of benefit or are a result of some beneficial process. The point here is, uh, folks, that these are all results of processes which allow for the abundance and diversity of life on Earth. All right? There's no way to get rid of these things without getting rid of some other important things that make life even possible uh, on this planet. Um, so this gives us a little bit of a perspective on the environmental conditions that are often called natural evil. Right Now, just because time doesn't allow, we can't go into some of the other things that we talked about, you know, at length. But you get an idea. These processes are required for advanced life. We need these things to be here. It's unfortunate that human beings, you know, get in the way of these things and, and suffer from these things. But the alternative to get rid of these things would be a lot worse uh, if, if we didn't have those. So, at that point, then, let's turn our attention to the other uh, arm of this natural evil that we're going to be talking about, and that is the, the biological evil. Now, this category has to do with things that attack us from the inside, right? Up to this point, we've been talking about things from the outside, weather and, and geologic conditions and so on. Biological evil has to do with the inside uh, and experiencing suffering from that. Uh, this can include things like genetic disease, cancer, bacteria, viruses, and so on. Now, with regard to those first two, genetic disease and cancer, um, genetic disease and cancer really are just a result of mutations uh, within the genetic code. And these mutations are passed on either through reproductive cells from parent to offspring or uh, due to errors in um, uh, cellular replication. When our cells reproduce themselves as they're supposed to, errors sometimes creep in. So we get one of those two things, genetic uh, disorders and, and, and cancer, by means of one of those processes. Now, it's important to understand that although we were created with an optimal genome, we really were, um, we exist inside a universe that is undergoing a process of decay. 
that's just part and parcel of the, of the universe that we live in. It is experiencing decay. And it's really not hard to see how this works in our own creation. We make things as human beings, don't we? And how often do those things fail? I mean, um, as a species, we've produced computer-based technology that advances at an exponential rate. Ten years ago, the kind of stuff we had compared to today, it's amazing. And in ten years, it'll even be more amazing. The, the growth of technology is incredible that we're experiencing. These machines can do work for us that would otherwise take us uh, vastly greater amounts of time. And yet, that data is compiled and copied and computed uh, so, and so forth over and over again. It's still grounded in physical pieces, right? The hardware of the equipment that we use, these, these advanced computers, that's still in the physical universe that's subject to decay. So, within computer systems, data corruption occurs from time to time. And I bet you most of us in this room have experienced that. <laughs> yeah, if you've ever seen the blue screen of death, you know what it's like to get data corruption inside a computer system. Um, so it should be no surprise to us that this occurs within biological systems uh, as well. But it is noteworthy that the mutation within the human genome is the lowest, is among the lowest of all the eukaryotes. So what that means is, setting aside like bacteria and algae, we have one of the lowest mutation rates of all life. That's pretty astonishing and important, I think. Um, now, though the Bible doesn't speak of it specifically, um, Reasons to Believe has offered some speculation that, that it's at least possible, and I think you could agree, it's at least possible that in the Garden of Eden, the Tree of Life offered a supplement to Adam and Eve that protected them from some of these mutations. Now, maybe they would have got them anyway. We don't know. I mean, again, it's speculation. But it's at least possible that that was the case, that they were protected until, of course, they, the fall when they rejected God and, and sinned and so on and were cast out. But if that's the case, then this mutation that we, what we see affecting us is more of a product of moral evil. It's decisions that were made by human beings that cut them off from that source that allowed them those protections. So again, it would be more a result of us, as human beings, making bad choices, and not so much a, a natural evil. But again, that's, that's speculative, so we don't know for sure. Um, let's talk about bacteria. Bacteria uh, also have some benefits. They've really been instrumental in the early formation of the Earth. Uh, they played... Uh, a role, a key role in transforming the atmosphere and, and oceans to make advanced life possible uh, here on Earth. They created metal deposits that are now available. I mean, obviously we use metal quite a lot in this building alone. My goodness, how much metal is there? Uh, they played a pretty key element in making metal deposits for us to later find and use uh, in building the, the structures and things that we build. They've also uh, helped it, uh, maintain human health. Now, it's interesting to note that in our body, we've got some 10 trillion human cells. Okay, that's a lot. 10 trillion. How, how many bacterial cells do you think there are? 10 times that. 100 trillion bacterial cells on our interior and exterior, exterior surfaces uh, in, in our bodies. Uh, they're there, and they're doing some pretty important things. Um, they, there's, there has been indications that bacteria on our skin help prevent excessive inflammation whenever we get injured. Uh, in addition, bacteria in our digestive systems help draw out energy from food. They serve all kinds of useful purposes in our body. And in fact, if we look at the pathogenic uh, bacteria that's out there, they make up a very, very small percent of all bacteria. It's something like 1% or something of all bacteria, bacterial species pathogenic ones, the ones that harm us. So it's really small uh, compared to how many types there are. But because bacteria, like the cells of animals and humans, mutate, um, once beneficial bacteria can become harmful bacteria. It's, it's again not hard to think about how something that was beneficial to us at one point could mutate just through copying itself and become harmful to us. Uh, additionally, some bacteria can be well suited for one kind of host, but then move hosts and find that it's not so well suited for the other. So for instance, there's some kind of bacteria which might be well suited for animals. 
But if it were to move hosts into us, it may be the case that it's harmful to us, though it was useful to the animal. And of course, that's just a, a product of, the, of the, you know, the, the bacterial cells moving to us and, and finding a new host. So again, benefits of bacteria. If we got rid of these, we're going to have some problems digesting and some other stuff that's probably not so good for us. Let's talk about viruses. Again, there are some benefits to viruses. Uh, viruses can be critical in keeping uh, plant and animal populations in check. So again, if we've got a problem of over overgrowth, if we've got species running wild in a particular ecosystem, viruses can be instrumental in weeding down some of that species so that, so that there isn't an imbalance in that ecosystem. They can play a, a pivotal role in that. Viruses can provide nucleation sites uh, for rainwater as well. And even recent studies have indicated that viruses are involved in the ocean's nutrient cycle. Apparently, there's quite a bit of, of viral species in the ocean, far more than, than without the, outside of the ocean. So um, they play a pretty important role there, apparently, as well as some recent studies have shown. Now let's talk about where viruses come from. There's not uh, uniform agreement on this. There are a couple of theories about where viruses come from, but the one predominant theory is that they were once bacteria. And when they infected another host, they lost some of their uh, machinery that helped them survive on their own in lieu of taking over the machinery of the host they just infected. And because of that, as they begin replicating and so on, they had lost that machinery. So it very well may be they started out as bacteria, maybe even useful bacteria in some way, and just mutated away those things uh, and, and became harmful. So um, at any rate, we are once again faced with the truth that we could not do away with these processes. Uh, and organisms without seriously and adversely affecting our universe and our Earth's ability to sustain advanced life. These things need to be here in order to sustain the life that we've got. So, again, important stuff. Now, there is no doubt that natural evil can have a profound effect on many people's lives. Um, if you have ever been through any of the stuff we've been talking about, any of those environmental uh, natural disasters, uh, if you're enduring any of these biological uh, things that, that, that can be detrimental to your health, um, then you're fully aware of how traumatic these things can be. And I don't want to trivialize that, okay? Those things affect us profoundly. They, they, are, um, they have very adverse effects. It can be very traumatic. I don't want to trivialize that, but I do think that it is sometimes valuable to put things in perspective, okay? Sometimes more is made of the, the overall impact of these things than is actually the case. So to that end, here's a chart that I want to take a minute uh, and, and survey. Uh, this chart reflects the, the extreme impact of natural evil. This, these are not average numbers, folks. These are like worst case scenarios of the impact of natural evil on people in the US annually. As you can see in each one of these categories, the numbers are pretty small in terms of percentage of population, adding up to a total of 3.2%. This is just people affected by these things. These aren't deaths, okay, and it's not average. If you were to take the average annually, this number drops to around 2%. That's not a lot. Again, I'm not trivializing the impact on us individually, but overall, that's not a very big number. Now, um, I, looked, I happened to look up just to see on an individual level cancer. I took the 2010 CDC report for deaths by, uh, be, uh, uh, with cancer as a cause. Uh, compared to the 2010 census uh, for the United States, and what I found is that deaths due to cancer in 2010 were less than 0.2% of the entire population. Again, not trivializing, but it does put things in perspective as to how big uh, this impact uh, is. Now, it's certainly true that in other countries, larger percentages are affected by these things. So we can't ignore that. In other areas of the world, uh, there are bigger impacts from some of these uh, things that we call natural evil. However, there is a startling correlation between the degree of impact on a country and that country's economic status, as well as its government's degree of corruption. So there's some kind of relationship there. For instance, there must be more than just geographic factors involved when you look at the impact of equivalent earthquakes throughout the world. So for instance, in Japan in 2011, there was a 9.0 magnitude earthquake resulting in approximately 21,000 deaths. However, in Sumatra, 
in 2004, a 9.1 magnitude earthquake caused nearly 228,000 deaths. Again, in India, in 2001, a 7.6 magnitude earthquake caused 20,000 deaths. And yet, in 2010, a weaker earthquake, a 7.0 in Haiti, caused some 316,000 deaths. Again, there must be more than just geographic things going on here. Sure, those things play a, play a part, but that can't be all. And of course, if corruption and economic strife um, are, are involved in these things, if it's the government's being corrupt and, and people oppressing people and so on, well, then that brings us right back to moral evil, doesn't it? That's actually people who are causing a greater impact. No, it's not the entire thing. Of course, even with the best technology today, people still die from these things. These people are still affected. But you can see where people play a part in this as well to adjust those numbers. There's some moral evil involved in how wide this scale is. Um, now let's talk about this, this argument uh, at large, this argument of the evidential problem of evil. This argument ultimately does fail um, for a couple of reasons. But the first reason that I want to talk about is that we are simply not in a position to determine the probability of God's existence based on the evil in the world. How can we possibly know? Right? I mean, um, in order to say that evil in the world makes God's existence impossible, we have to say God probably doesn't have good reasons for allowing the evil that we see around us. How can we know that? How can we know that God doesn't have good reasons for allowing these things? Um, could he possibly have good reasons? Well, if you know anything about chaos theory, um, you'll know that it claims that within large-scale systems, very small events um, connected over large causal change can have really enormous results. Right? So one famous example is, is that of the, the butterfly uh, fluttering its wings in, in Africa somewhere that sets off a, a series of, of causal uh, chain reactions that lead to a, a hurricane in the Atlantic. Now, we can say from the science this is possible, but is there any way that we could predict that hurricane from that butterfly? There's no way. I mean, the, the, the amount of things that we would have to consider is just far beyond anything that we have. We could not possibly predict something like that based on just the enormity of the task of gathering all that data and, and then knowing how it would all uh, affect each other. And similarly, we can't possibly know all of the effects of all the events that go on worldwide every second of every day. And yet, a God who knows everything would know these things, wouldn't he? Now, secondly, um, notwithstanding the evidence that we've seen this evening uh, about the value of some of these natural processes and, and, and um, biological organisms and things, we set that aside. Um, if the problem of evil were taken in isolation, okay, if that's all we had to go on about whether or not God exists and whether or not Christianity is true, if that's it, then the critic uh, and skeptic might have a case, right? We might be able to say, gosh, that's all we've got. Maybe you got something there. But of course, that's not all we've got. Right? That's not it. As we talked about, the evidence is tonight of the value of some of these things. But over and above that, we've got a plethora of other evidences, not only for the existence of God, but for the, the truth of Christianity, the reliability of the New Testament, and the historicity of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. We've got an overabundance of evidence in favor of the Christian worldview, which includes the idea that God exists. Uh, the problem of evil, while popular and often pers persuasive, simply cannot overturn the preponderance of evidence in favor of the Christian worldview. We've just, we've got it in spades. We've just got so much of it. Now, what's more, this idea of evil, not only does it not overturn the evidence, but it's really a secret weapon for us. As believers, we can use this and turn the tables, so to speak, as well. The existence of evil <coughs> itself is evidence for the existence of God. Now, to appreciate this, we need to talk about uh, and understand the difference between what are called objective truths and subjective truths. Okay? Objective truths and subjective truths. Now, if I said to you, chocolate is the most tasty flavor of ice cream, is that true? Yeah. <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah, what's that? Subjectively, maybe. There you go, subjectively. <clears throat> it depends on who you ask, right? If you ask me, I'd probably say, yeah, that's about right, at least of the plain flavors. I kind of like cookies and cream, but I'll go with chocolate for the plain flavors. I think it is the most tasty. So yeah, that's true for me. But it's true in as much as it relates to my perspective, right? You could disagree. You could say, hey, vanilla's the tastiest of all flavors of ice cream, and you'd be right as well because it's based on your perspective. You see how that works out? It's subjective because it relates to the subject. It relates to my perspective on the issue and your perspective on the issue. That's what makes it a subjective truth. However, if I said to you, I am a human being, that's also true, right? But it's not because it relates to my perspective. If you disagree with me on this one and instead want to claim that I'm a duck, well, we can't both be right on this. Both of those things cannot be true at the same time. Instead, anyone claiming that I'm a duck would simply be wrong. Okay? This is an objective truth because it does not relate to my perspective on the issues. It relates to the way things really are. You see the distinction there? Now, <clears throat> similarly, when critics decry the evil of the world as evidence against God, they're not using the word evil in a sense to mean their personal taste. They're not saying, you know, those, all those deaths over there, I just don't happen to personally like those. I mean, you might, but I don't, so I'd rather not see them because I don't like them. That's not what they're saying. When they're using this word evil, they mean it in the objective sense, okay? They mean there really is wrong out there, whether or not you agree with it. This is the way it really is in reality. That's what they're claiming. Yet, to claim this, there has to be an objective standard of good outside of opinion and preference in order to determine what is not good. You see how that works? There's got to be some kind of standard to say, this is good, so that we know what isn't good. And it has to be objective, if that's what they're claiming. But where does the standard come from? Where do we get it? Well, <clears throat> we can't derive it from science. Science only tells us what is the case. It doesn't tell us what ought to be the case. Okay? We cannot derive ought from is. That's a pretty fundamental principle. But science just tells us what is the case. It describes it for us. So we can't get this objective standard of good from science. How about evolution? Well, we can't get it from evolution either. Because, again, it's the same kind of thing. It just tells us the way things are, at least from that perspective, from that world view. It tells us how some life came to be, back to a certain point anyway. <clears throat> at which point, the scientists shrug their shoulders and we say, we don't know how it happened before that. But at any rate, evolution can't give us that standard. Because it just tells us how things are. And even if it could, even if we wanted to appeal to evolutionary, uh, or evolutionary worldview to get the standard of good, why should we use the evolutionary perspective? So let's say we said, well, evolution has brought us to live together in peace and harmony and so on. Well, why should I follow evolution? I mean, what is, what, what is the, impetus for me, the impetus for me to, to go about doing things the evolutionary way? There just isn't one. So we can't get this standard from evolution either. Well, how about sociology? What if we look to societies for the answer? Some people want to claim this. They claim, well, you know, we've all gotten together and we've agreed. This is what's good and this is what's bad. Well, that's fantastic. Which society? Because we can all think of at least one society in history that thought it was a good idea to round up all people of a certain race and systematically exterminate them. Is that the society we want to point to for our standard of good and evil? I certainly hope not. So we can't get this from society either because societies might disagree. In fact, we can't even get it from any human source. Because I might have a view of what is good and evil, but your view might be different. And what makes my view any better or worse than yours? Nothing, right? There's no way to establish whose view is better or worse. Instead, in order to appeal to an objective evil, there must be a transcendent standard of good that is over and above humans there must be something we can look to to say, that's the standard of good. That is to say, there must be a transcendent moral law. Okay, But, in order to have a transcendent moral law, you have to have a transcendent moral law giver. Right? 
So lo and behold, by appealing to objective evil, the critic is implicitly acknowledging the existence of God as the standard of good. We turned it right around on him now. So, <coughs> again, evil can be used as evidence in favor of the existence of God. Not only doesn't it work against the existence of God, but it works in favor of it. Now, um, I want to make one caveat about this information tonight, and, and I touched on it uh, briefly earlier. Um, there is a distinction between intellect and emotion, right? Now, we are intellectual creatures, right? We've got minds, and we think deeply about things. We have the potential to do amazing things with our minds. But that's not all we are, right? It's not just straight, it's not the Mr. Spock or the, you know, the, 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 the android that's, that's pure logic. That's not all we are. As, from a holistic perspective, we've got more to us than just the intellect. Now, this information we've been talking about tonight is valuable for someone who is wrestling with the problem of evil on a purely intellectual level. In fact, we can help bolster our faith with this kind of information. We can help share our faith with others who are wrestling with this on an intellectual level. Yet, it is not valuable who's, for someone who is hurting because they just lost a loved one. It's not valuable for someone whose home was just destroyed by a natural disaster. It's not valuable for someone who just got diagnosed with a terminal illness. And it's important for us to be able to see the distinction. Because if we were to try to give this kind of information to someone who is deeply hurting, we're going to come off as cold and callous. We need to be aware of what's going on in people's lives. And the problem of evil touches us on a personal, emotional level as well. However, on the Christian worldview, there is hope for those who are suffering. Right? We all know this. And that's that God has provided an answer to the problem of evil. I mean, often this is touted as, what's, you know, God can't exist because there's this evil. Well, that just assumes that God has not answered. And in fact, he has answered this problem. As believers, we know uh, that Christ's death on the cross has provided us a future eternity with God where we don't have to experience this kind of suffering, right? Um, I think it's, it's probably fitting. We, we've read this plenty of times. This is brought up a lot. Uh, I hope you can see this. It's brought up a lot as uh, uh, in this group. Uh, Hugh Ross talks about it plenty. But I think this is pretty fitting for what we're talking about tonight. Revelation 21, 1 through 5. <clears throat> and it says, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. We talk about this plenty in here. A new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth passed away, and there is no longer any sea. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, made ready as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is among men, and he will dwell among them. And they shall be his people, and God himself will be among them. And he will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will no longer be any death. There will no longer be any mourning or crying or pain. The first things have passed away. And he who sits on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. This is the promise. This is God's answer to the problem of evil. And as, we've, as has been discussed in this group, plenty, the new heavens and the new earth that lie in store for us will not have the same physics as this universe. It'll be an entirely new set of physics that won't be subject to decay and pain and suffering. These things are going to be gone. And this is God's answer to the problem of evil. That this has not happened yet uh, has no bearing on the fact that he hasn't provided an answer, right? It doesn't do us any good to say, <clears throat> God doesn't exist because right here and now, pain, pain and suffering are still in existence. There's still evil. Yeah, there are right now. But there won't be at some point, and that is God's answer. So, frankly, uh, when it boils down to it, what's the alternative to this view? I'm reminded of a 20th century atheist philosopher, uh, Bertrand Russell, who said, uh, while pondering this issue at one point, he said, no one can sit at the bedside of a dying child and still believe in God. No one can sit at the bedside of a dying child and still believe in God. His implication is, when we view this pain and suffering, it leads us to believe there can't be a God. But here's the thing. What's the atheist's response to this problem? Tough luck? You're not the fittest? You see, 
we need to remember that the problem of evil isn't just a problem for Christians. It's a problem for everybody. We all have to deal with this problem one way or another. But the good news is that the Christian worldview not only provides the best explanation of reality, but it also offers the most satisfying hope for the future. Thank you very much for your time. I appreciate it. Um, I'll open the floor to questions if anybody has any. Yeah, please. Actually, I probably have enough for everyone. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> oh, hey, let me just say, again, I want to I reinforce this point. I'm not a scientist, so if you've got scientific questions, I'll still, you know, I'll, I'll still attempt to answer them, but I may have to yield to some of our more scientific folks here. Uh, so hopefully you've got a lot of philosophical questions. I'll be able to. <laughs> okay. Hey, go ahead, Greg. No worries on this. All right. Uh, on this, uh, you talked about uh, people, uh, even non-Christians, believing in objective uh, but do you think it is true today, and I, I think of philosophy like postmodernism and so on, would, would you say that objective truth itself is under attack today? And if that's the case, if that's true, then how do you, how do you deal with people who are kind of into that sort of thing? Yeah, um, well, yes, to some degree it is. Uh, there's been debate about how much there is a postmodern society. Some people say we're really postmodern, others say no, no, we're still modern, or we moved even beyond that, or whatever. But yes, there is to some degree some attack on that. Uh, uh, particularly people who like that sort of new groovy thing that everybody's cool and it's all good and no, no worries and no problems. So yeah, no objective truth. Um, uh, I do still think that objective truth is held out in plenty of venues. Uh, Richard Dawkins, you guys know who Richard Dawkins is, right? Uh, one of the four horsemen of the, the new atheists, so to speak. Uh, big proponent of atheism, big critic of Christianity and, and theism altogether. Some call him an anti-theist. Uh, at any rate, in his God delusion, he's got his own version of the Ten Commandments. Uh, so it, it seems, to, and yet, he, he even says other places, he goes and he, he, he tries to be consistent. He says, well, no, there can't be really objective evil. But then he goes on and, and says, this thing's wrong, and this thing's wrong, and this thing's wrong. Well, you see, that's a problem. Um, it, it doesn't work out. If you're going to be consistent and have objective evil, if you're really going to say this is wrong, whether or not you agree with it, then you've got to have a standard for that. <clears throat> However, to the second part of your question, how do you deal with somebody who wants to play the there is no objective evil? Well, I like what Greg Kokel says. He says, steal their stereo. Yeah, 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 steal their right? stereo. Yeah, now of course he doesn't mean that literally. He doesn't really want you to go steal their stereo, but you get the point. Once something bad happens to them, they're going to be the first to raise their hand and say, hey, that's wrong, right? And the point is, people are eager to, to, um, to put forward this view, yeah, there's no objective evil, but they cannot live consistently with it. It just doesn't happen. So. Go ahead. Uh, another response to that, to someone who says there is no objective truth, you can ask them, is that true? <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's right. That's right. If they go that if they go that route of uh, of of saying no objective truth, then they have they have offered a self defeating argument there. It does not live up to its own standards, its own criteria. And the same thing I've heard said about moral evil, a uh, moral uh, moral truth rather. Uh, if someone says there's no objective morality, well now they're making a statement about morality. So again, self defeating in that way. Go ahead, Dan. Yeah, I I think um, Christians today were so on the defensive. That once we realize, like, like you know, like when, uh, <clears throat> uh, gosh, what's his name? Um, you know, that British guy on CNN who just, uh, oh, Pierce Morgan. Pierce Morgan yeah. Right, he comes out and says, well, how dare you judge the homosexuals? But then you're judging the people that are judging, right? And so, right. But Christians are not trained to recognize these kind of stuff. And so they try to defend something that's impossible. It's all, well, you know, the, the, you know, they go into, which they have no argument. Right. Yeah, and so... Oh, the other thing was, I actually served um, as a jury, and you know, it's scary. It's scary because, not everybody, but a lot of people, they, they don't have any sense of morals, and so they're all relativistic, mm -hmm. and they were about to let this guy go because they put themselves in that situation and go, well, you know, I, I did that. Mm -hmm. I was like, wait a minute, <laughs> there's no <laughs> reference point in, in how you guys are thinking. Well, it doesn't matter if you guys would be doing that. Right. But what does the law say? And they're like, I mean, they have to think about it for a while. Right. Yeah, that, that, is, that is highly prob problematic. Yeah. Uh, and and it, it couples with, 
the idea of, of not wanting to judge at all, right? We're in a society where, where we hear this all the time. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not judging. I'm not judging. And Christians will be the first to say, hey, you're not supposed to judge. We'll say something like, you know, um, abortion is wrong, right? Oh, you're not supposed to judge. Well, yeah, we actually are. The scriptures do indicate, right? Even Jesus said uh, about the person, uh, you know, that wants, to, wants to, to, you know, get the speck out of his brother's eye, right? What does he say? He says, first get the log out of your own eye. Then you can see clearly to see the, get the speck out of your brother's eye, right? So he's not saying, don't get the speck out at all. He's saying, wait, wait, first, don't be a hypocrite. <laughs> then you can go deal with. And various places, Paul writes and says that, that we're supposed to judge. We're even going to be judging the angels. We're supposed to be able to distinguish between right and wrong. What we're not supposed to do is be hypocritical and try to tell people, you know, um, that we know what their salvation is going to be and so on. And we can't really do that. That's in God's hands. But we can and should judge by saying this thing is morally right, this thing is morally wrong. We're, we're supposed to do that. Go ahead, Fred. Amen. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say, I, I'd offer a perspective on why scientists and intellectuals today have an, an ultimate fear of absolute truth. And that is, given the fact that we human beings are part of the natural universe, given the fact that absolute truth exists, that means the natural part of the universe, we, if we accept absolute truth, that means per se that absolute truth, a spiritual reality, directly affects the natural universe. Mm. And that's what they can't handle. Yeah. Yeah, that's definitely a problem whenever, uh, you know, atheists today who, who by and large are materialists, that is to say, they, they believe that only, you know, matter in motion, particles in motion, that's all we are. Just whatever the material universe is, that's all that exists. Those kinds of things, when those things interfere with their worldview, they're very, uh, very resistant to those things. They don't want to let those things in. Anything that points to the, those kinds of non-physical realities, truth and the mind and those kind of things, they just, they, across the board, want to reject those things. So, or they want to be inconsistent say, I'll take a little piece of this, I'll take a little piece of this, and then somehow make them work. I would tend to say, I, I don't know, you know, what, what their role would be. I don't have anything, you know, in my pocket to say, yeah, dingoes have this value to the environment. But I, I can't say that. Um, what I would say is, would that, would that person claim that it was a problem for the dingo to eat an animal? I mean, what about all those dingoes that are going and, you know, killing the, I don't know what dingoes eat, but whatever, killing the rats or yeah, something. Yeah. What about all the dingoes going and killing those rats? You know, that's, that's evil. Would, would, would anybody say that? I don't think so. I think we would say, well, dingoes eat and so whatever they come across that they eat, that's what they eat. And it's tragic that children have been killed by this. But, you know, what's, what's the alternative? Make dingoes not eat? Or you're going to give dingoes intelligence so they can say, no, I don't really like this on the menu today. No humans for me. I'm going to have rats. Oh, I mean, what are you going to do? So, the, the, again, it's easy, to, it's e easy for critics to kind of step back and... and you know, try to poke holes in somebody else's view. Uh, but what's going to be their answer? 
Well, what what do we do? What does God do then about the dingoes? Hey, I mean, you, you know, about the negative argument yeah. earlier. So, um, could you could you turn that around and say, mm -hmm. uh, well, you tell me what's what, what's so valuable about human beings? That's right. On their perspective. Well, from your perspective. Yeah. What's, what, what's Absolutely. So it, it, if they adhere to Darwinian evolution, then there shouldn't be anything especially valuable about human beings. And if you put emphasis on human beings over the rest, then you're a speciesist or something, you know, and that's, that's no good. So you're right. That's a good, uh, good way to turn it back around. Can I, oh, let me respond to what you were saying. The way I rec reconcile, because I've thought about the, the natural, natural evil concept, and it seems to me that uh, when you're talking about moral evil, that goes from man to man and God to man. God calls us, you know, accuses us of being evil. But I think when you're talking about natural evil, it, it always seems to be human to God. It's, it's an accusation to God. And, and because uh, it isn't so much the dingoes or the hurricanes, because they, they have a part in the, the ecology, but it's humans accusing God that you could have prevented my daughter or, my, or these people from dying under those conditions. And so it seems to me like when we're talking about natural evil, it's always an accusation from man. To God. Yeah. That's um, God in the dock. Yeah. Right. <clears throat> Excuse me. And I've heard I've heard some arguments said before, uh, you know, well, why is there so much evil? You know, why doesn't God step in and, and you know stop that electrical fire that results in that, you know, infant's death or something like that? Why didn't God just shut the power off there or, or whatever, whatever? Uh, but those ten, those same people tend to recognize that God's not going to step in and stop every single thing. They, they realize how absurd it would be for God to start tinkering with every single thing. You know, if that were the case, of course, if God tinkered with everything, then we would have no science. We would have no basis on which we could say, this is the way things work in the world, to point to a, you know, our, our, our creator as being wise and making things for us to observe the heavens and the work of his hands and so on and so on. Science wouldn't exist if he was always tinkering with these things. It's precisely because we have this system that, that works the same way in the natural world that we can develop the technology that we have, that we can rely upon science and art formula and so on. But to those people that would say, well, why, God, why didn't God stop a, a few more of them? Well, that's kind of a tough question anyway, isn't it? How many is, how many is enough? And for that matter, how do we know that we don't have more of them because God did stop some of them? So, you know, you're in this weird gray zone where it's like, well, how much is enough then for you? And, and they ultimately never have the answer to that. They're just, again, they're just trying to kind of say, no, it's God's fault. No, it's, which ultimately, folks, honestly, points to most of the time a deeper problem anyway. It's not really an intellectual problem that's going on something else. So, yeah. I guess if I were an atheist, the way I would try to argue it would be, kind of going off of what Danny was saying, is the real problem is that it's not the hurricane that's evil, but it's God that's evil kind of thing. Well, I would say, I'm an atheist. I don't believe in evil. Let's just say that. I don't believe that any of this is, you know, I don't believe in objective evil. But you do. You are a Christian, so you do believe in evil, but you also believe in God. So that's where I see the contradiction, is that you believe in two things that are, are contradictory. I don't have that problem because I don't believe in evil and I don't believe in God. Mm. So no problem with me. It's you're, you're the one that's got the problem. Yeah. Yeah, that, how realistic is that? Because <laughs> right? Because yes. I mean, somebody who said you can say that you don't believe in evil, but we all know that's not true. Because well, when true. evil falls on you, you're gonna be the first one to. <laughs> so I think yeah. if somebody says that, you can just hey, yeah. I don't basically really, you know, call their bluff. And yeah, say, you're, you, you're you not really being believe that? you're not being intellectually honest just with yourself. Slug them in. How about that? Yeah, exactly. Don't, <laughs> don't do that, please. Don't. Stop the recording. That's a good... That's a good. Yeah. The poor atheist simply doesn't understand the difference between ultimate badness mm. and pure evil. Mm. He doesn't see anything, he, oh. so he won't accept. And he, he believes something bad, but he won't call it evil. Mm. Oh, sure. Mm. Yeah. 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 That, and that's, that's where I think that definition, we talked about it near the outset, is helpful. What do we mean by evil? Because it can take on a variety of meanings. But departure yeah. from the way things ought to be, we all kind of have a sense of the way things ought to be. And there's sort of an intuitive sense that we've got on that. So even atheists who would like to deny it. Any other questions? Go ahead. You know, one further question. Uh, on the biological end of natural evil, uh, I, I think there might be two perspectives. And I was wondering what you think. Because uh, uh, on biological evil, 
I think it involves either purpose or intent. And that involves, uh, a, 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 it, that involves itself something that's not happen, happen since. It's like even a bacteria has a purpose. Mm -hmm. And that per and we're talking about the purpose to harm or the uh, intent to harm, and that makes it evil. Yeah. Well, and of course, uh, for an atheist, they would say, I mean, again, if, if they adhere to a Darwinian perspective, they're just going to say its purpose is to try to get more of it. it you know, it's going to breed. It wants to, re you know, uh, populate as much as it can with its own species and uh, have its species thrive. That's its purpose. Though they don't even like to use the word purpose because you know, they claim it. It doesn't have a purpose. So they're going to say that's what it's that's what it's driving for, yeah. even if it, that's not a greater purpose. So, yeah. its ultimate yeah. purpose is ultimate destruction. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and, and, it, and it, by means of reproducing itself, which yeah. is what they think all species are trying to do to get their species to thrive. So, yeah. And the environmental doesn't involve, except for God, doesn't involve purpose or intent. Yeah. No, you're right, and that's the thing. That goes back to the things that I, I mentioned, water and gravity. Um, those things just the, are the way they are. I mean, mm -hmm. uh, again, fire is really important, right? You've got, uh, there was a, uh, again, this kind of goes back to uh, something that, that comes to mind. There was a, a um, 20th century atheist philosopher, William Rowe, who gave a thought experiment. He talked about, uh, 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 you know, a, will, uh, a wooded area. He said if, the, if that wooded area caught fire, suppose that there was a fawn that was trapped in there somewhere. And instead of dying right away, this, this fawn suffered for three days because of this fire until it finally died. That's terrible. Now, how are you going to reconcile that with God? Well, and, and, and that is terrible, I admit. You know, I, I'm not going to try to take that away or trivialize it. It is. But what would the atheist suggest then? So what we've got in that scenario is the, the suffering due to fire, right? Fire is combustion of fuel in an oxygenated environment, right? So what are you going to take away now? You're going to take away combustion? Well, now you've got big problems because now we've got no cars and we've got no jets and we've got no you know, transportation and, and, and you might even start uh, encroaching on the sun's ability to, you know, to, to um, have nuclear fusion and, and develop the heat from that and so on and so on. You've got big problems if you're going to do away with the combustion. How about the fuel? Well, the fuel is the trees. So you're going to do away with plant life? <laughs> what are you going to do? Or how about this? We'll just take away the oxygen, so Bambi suffocates instead of burning. I mean, there really isn't. What are you going to do? Then? Yeah. So, so what's the answer then? I mean, it's a great thing to, to pull pull at our heartstrings and say that's terrible, and it is. But what would the atheist suggest God do? We have fire as a valuable means. Combustion is a value, valuable means to our society and our thriving as God's creation. So it plays a part that animals and people get in the way from time to time, though tragic. Doesn't make the fire evil. Hey, I'm trying to understand maybe about evil and did it, did it always exist? Um, did evil always exist? You mean like forever? Forever, yeah. Um, well, or did it start at fall or did it start uh, when did evil begin if it, if it didn't? Well, <coughs> I don't know. I don't know that I can give a definitive. Of, I mean, it depends again on what you mean by evil. We're we talking about natural evil. We're we talking about those things as well. If, if we're talking about like, I mean, again, natural evil in terms of like, say, death of, of animals. Well, that. That's all part of the the, the, the setup of our universe. Right. So I guess you could kind of bring it back to uh, the the creation of the universe. Yeah. I mean, that's when decay began, right? right? At a at a at a universal scale, anyway. Uh, before that, did it really? You know, didn't, okay, so when? Go ahead. No, he the creation of the earth. He said it was good. It was good. It was, it was good. very good. It was, yes, he did say it was good. Well, what does the word good mean? This is something Hugh Ross talks about a lot, right? <laughs> what, what are we, when, when, when the Bible says that God surveyed his creation and it was very, it was good, it was very good, does that mean um, without decay? In terms of, often we like to apply the word perfect to that. It doesn't actually say perfect, it mm -hmm. says good. Or does that just mean working completely the way God intended for it to work. And that's what reasons to believe would often, am I right about this, guys? Reasons to believe is going to say, when, when that word there means good, or very good, it, when it says that, it means it's functioning 
exactly the way God intended it to function. Not so much that there's no decay, or that there's no death or, you know, from animals and things like that, but that it is functioning properly the way God intended it to function. And death could be a part of that function. And death could be a part of that function. I mean, can't death be. Death start, though. No, no, I don't. Death isn't. Death only came after. A decision was made. Yeah, well, what do you, eating. wait, what do you mean by death? Do you mean human death, or do you mean plant death, or bacteria death? Well, animal death. Death when. But not plant? I don't even think there was plant death. Well, no, they, they were herbivores. Excuse me? The Bible describes that they, you know, God gave them plants for, for their sustenance as eating, so. Oh, but that's not death. Well, because <laughs> then you have to define life, right? And that's one of the toughest things I'm to define. I'm just thinking it keeps, the plant life was always living, and because Adam and Eve needed consumption, it just, they ate, and then. But there's, there's also the, the narrative where them being kicked out of Garden of Eden. They, but that only came after the wrong well, That's correct, but there's, there's also speculation that, well, were, were they going to live forever without the, the tree of life? Or were they being sustained in the garden with the tree of life? And, and when they fell, they were kicked out. And you had the cherubims guarding the entrance of the right. gar garden. So were they being sustained because of tree of life? And were there yes. death of animals as kind of a, a, kind of a well-functioning ecosystem outside and inside of that? But most people like to think that death of all sorts came after the fall, mm -hmm. which there's kind of Different views on that, and so. So, still, when is when did evil did evil always exist? Well, <coughs> I would have to say no, it didn't always exist. Uh, if evil is a departure of the way things ought to be, well, so long as with God being, you know, the the eternally existent being, um, so long as He is morally perfect, morally, you know, um, uh, uh, flawless. Mm -hmm. Um, then there wouldn't be any departure from the way things ought to be. So I would say before creation, mm -hmm. there could not have been evil because all there was was God. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, I mean, it's hard to even say so before creation. So what creation brought evil? evil? Yeah. So you're saying with creation <clears throat> evil? Well, because he made the tree of good and e the knowledge of good and evil. So he created that tree. And, and you're saying then that's when evil... When people ate from that tree, the no, evil no. started. Well, evil, evil is also defined as a kind of a lack of goodness, right? So <laughs> taken away from, from, from being right. holy. Because Adam and Eve, they were mutable, but they were sinless until they, they fell. Mm -hmm. So that's when the, um, the departure from the oddness occurred. So if you, for, from my perspective, I actually think that when, when Lucifer sinned against God, mm -hmm. that was technically when evil entered in terms of the biblical context. Mm -hmm. Morally. <clears throat> Morally. Morally. Well, I, yeah. think, I think evil is always, a, like you said, agent to agent. Yeah. So, so that's why you can't murder a chicken, right? right. Because it's not a person. <laughs> right. Right. You can kill a chicken, but it's never, a, you know. Yeah. And if you abuse animals, it's only, that's only immoral because God gave us the command to be good stewards. Right. Mm -hmm. So it always goes back to uh, agent to agent. Now, and then, of course, Lucifer came and tempted Eve. It's a, it's a mystery why a holy being would choose to do evil. That we can't answer. Mm -hmm. But I think we could say that it entered with Lucifer and subsequently with Adam and Eve. Mm -hmm. And then mm -hmm. they depart, departed from the, right. the ultimate oughtness. But, but again, I would say if, you're, if, if you want to include the natural things, which to me, again, I would argue, it's difficult to even call them evil, mm -hmm. particularly when agents are, aren't affected. Mm -hmm. So um, if human beings aren't being affected by, you know, catastrophic storms mm -hmm. in the early earth, the early mm -hmm. stages of it, well, then it's hard to see where there would be any evil of any meaningful sense there. So, right. it, it, you know, um, if you're going to exclude that natural part, then it would have to be at some point after, after the fall, you know, when humans began to be affected by the storms and mm -hmm. the things of outside the garden, the protected area of the Garden of Eden. Uh, but again, it, that, 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 that hinges on what you're calling evil. So right. that's, that's why it's so tough to, yeah, to pin it down. Yeah. You know, I'm trying to staple jello here. You know, so. <laughs> <laughs> I tend to agree with him, uh, at least as I understood him, that the fall of Lucifer was the beginning of evil. Mm -hmm. But it seems to me like that evil actually entered the world uh, at the Garden of Eden. And that was when man began to suffer from evil was that from that point forth. 
However, it seems to me like when you get into the world, world of natural evil, there is such a thing as God's laws being broken and the natural effects of uh, breaking those laws. If I choose to step off of a 100-story building, it's pretty obvious what's going to happen uh, because of the fact that I broke the law. But I probably broke the law because I had in my, my heart a evil compulsion of some sort. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Alan, can you repeat some of yeah, the... He, yeah, he was, yeah, he was I, talking I about... Sorry, I, yeah. <coughs> Excuse me. He was talking about natural evil and God's laws uh, in terms of like if you were to walk off a 10-story building or something like that. Um, you know, uh, God built into this universe gravity, and as a result of that, you're going to fall and you're going to likely die. Um, but he, he, as, he, as he pointed out, that there may even be something inside of me that drove me to that in the first place, a rebellion against God or something like that. Uh, but at any rate, you've got, you've got God's natural laws there working, gravity, the way they're supposed to. Uh, it's, it's just us getting in the way, in a sense. So, I don't know, I, I, I don't know if that answered your question so much. But I, again, I, like I said, it depends. But I, I think what these guys are saying here is, is probably pretty much as close as we can get. We got Lucifer, who really is the first of the of the right. evil acts, and then the effect on humankind happens after the fall and so on. If you can count anything before that as evil, I'm not really sure mm -hmm. how you can make it meaningful. But at any rate, uh, I don't think it existed forever. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And God made Lucifer. Yep, sure, made him good, <laughs> right? <laughs> well, God made Lucifer. Yeah. It had to come from somewhere. Well, that, that's the big mystery, because Lucifer was <laughs> yeah. also, angels were also, we say mutable, but <clears throat> sinless. What does mutable mean? Changeable. They're, They're we say, <laughs> Yeah, we're, we're, you know, we say God is immutable. So in his holiness, his holiness cannot be changed, but his, cre or his creature, creatures were mutable. So if you look at the whole start to finish of, of human history and Jesus' uh, redemptive work, uh, how does a holy God ultimately have fellowship with us, with the inevitable sinning of free creatures, free but mutable creatures? And I think if you look at it, that kind of the overall picture, you can kind of see what God's, <coughs> a little bit of what God's intent was, that human beings weren't, weren't we're too uh, human-centered, anthropocentric, right? We have that kind of view. But if you have a greater perspective, it's really a story about like the, the three godheads, right? You know, um, they have perfect union, they have perfect purpose. So Jesus was chosen to be the Lamb of God, and the Father gives the chosen people to him, to which Jesus dies for them. And it goes into a greater uh, theological context, but, um, you know, did God know that evil was going to come? I believe so. And he created us anyways. Mm -hmm. And if it was me rather than Adam... Would I have been man enough to say, no, Eve, I'm not going to eat that? No, I think inevitably it could have been any one of us, but evil would have entered no matter what. And that's, that's something that's philosophically difficult, you know, like, like you're sighing, right? Um, and I think that's like the ultimate problem that human beings deal with. Yeah. Yeah, Alvin Alva Flanagan calls that trans-world depravity. In any world God could have created, it's likely you would have done something wrong. So, right. Right. Interesting. I'll take one more question, then okay. we're going to have to leave some time for announcements at the end. Go ahead. Atheistic scientists and intellectuals do not realize it, but by complaining and saying there's evil, therefore God doesn't exist, they are actually re saying that if the universe was perfect, mm -hmm. everybody was happy that they would believe in God. Mm -hmm. That's the mistake, though. If that were a given, and everybody was happy and joyful, the question to them is, what's in it for God? Yeah. <laughs> just that simple. I mean, we, we reach out to God, and that's, that's one of the reasons that so-called evil exists. Yeah. yeah, that's right. God desires relationships with us that are meaningful, right? And, and of course, I guess, if we had everything hunky-dory, we wouldn't really need God for much, would we? Although it would still be wrong for us not to be in relationship with him, but I suppose uh, if we were sinful and everything was hunky-dory, then we probably wouldn't have much motivation to turn to God. So anyway, that's, that's a, a similar argument that's, that's used, uh, you know, for, uh, you know, why we're allowed to, you know, experience suffering and so on. There's, there's various theodicies and things. This is just one, it's, this is more of a, a scientific basis and background for the value of these things, but there are lots of 
responses to the problem of evil uh, and why God allows suffering far more than I could you know, cover in one evening and even several evenings. So at any rate, I thank you all for your time. I appreciate your attention and the, and the wonderful discussion as well. I'll stick around for a while afterwards. If you have any additional questions, please feel free to, to, to ask. I, I love talking about this stuff anyway. So uh, God bless everybody, and I'll turn it back over to Fred or Jim or both. Okay, we uh, thank you very much.